Um, can everybody hear me? I'd rather not use a microphone. You can hear me. Mike. Use the mic. Use the mic. All right. All right. He's getting there. First of all, happy Groundhog Day. No one has said that yet. Um, Do you see a shadow? Yeah. Yes. No heck. Um, okay, I'm going to use my time. I'm going to deviate from what you've been seeing so far today. This is more just a, a photo essay of what we go through um, to do what we do with, with egg take and a few things. But this is not like Wisconsin. Okay, so three things I'm going to try to quickly get through. Um, uh, we collect broodstock in the lower St. Lawrence River every year. Um, in the middle, uh, international section of the St. Lawrence, we've had a little bit of experience with sturdy spawning beds. Uh, and finally, we've got a small-scale tagging project in the eastern basin of Lake Ontario. So, firstly, for our egg take, we're taking fish out of the uh, Lake St. Francis population. Uh, the bulk of the jurisdiction is through Quebec. This is not really our water. So, it's Canadian waters mostly. Um, St. Regis Mohawk Tribe has some jurisdiction right down there. And our little corner of the world that we're working in for a brood stock is there at the end of the South Channel. Um, that's the Moses Saunders Power Project through which most of the Great Lakes water flows through. The South Channel is a bypass channel. Um, unless there's, there's some reason that they can't pass water through the hydro project, uh, it will go through the South Channel, but by and large, 99.9% .9 of the time, it is calm water. Uh, and that allows us to do what we do. So there, there's the outfall of the Moses Saunders Power Project, approximately 280,000 cubic feet per second, uh, give or take. Not a hospitable place to try and catch fish. So uh, we're over here in the mouth of the South Channel. Not much for, for current over there. We have four standard net sites that we use. We, we run a uh, large mesh <coughs> net, a uh, 10 and 12 inch stretch mesh. We just run our nets, get a tub of fish, and the uh, New York Power Authority has supplied us with a place to work. So uh, with a tub of fish, we go and we start sorting. So we get small fish, we get bigger fish, and very occasional hot ball, and I'll talk about the fish, not the, not the guy holding it. Um, that fish has no caudal fin. And we've, over, over the history of this project, we've had six or seven of those fish. Uh, they're quite healthy, by the way. Uh, we take standard biological data, total length. Everybody gets weighed. Everyone gets a pit tag, whether they want it or not. And because we're collecting root stock, uh, all of our fish are evaluated for sex and stage. Males, very easy, if it's a right male. Put on the back, uh, pressure on the ventral surface, and you'll, you'll get a little bit of milk to come out. Um, at least half of the fish, and we're gonna handle between one and 200 fish in our week to week and a half here. At least half of those fish are not spawners. Um, they congregate with the spawners, and when the spawners go out, those fish will also go out with them. Females, very different. Um, unlike Wisconsin, we can't just go scoop up fish on the side of the river. Um, I've handled one ripe running female in my career, and it has not been here. We have to evaluate all of our females uh, internally. And uh, for the most part, it's been surgical until 2009 when we started using this uh, hypodermic egg extraction device, which works really well. Uh, you go through the body wall, get the probe into the ovarian tissue, apply some suction to the syringe, and you, if it's a late stage gravid female, you will get eggs up into your, uh, into your tube. Now that's not without uh, a little bit of fight. We don't anesthetize our fish. The whole process takes between 30 seconds and a minute, so it's, it's very quick anyhow. Um, but when you get a, a fresh female that's um, quite feisty, it's all hands on deck to keep everything going along. And you can see that. Those are those nice dark eggs you're looking for in stage five. Um, but just because we get those dark eggs does not mean that that's necessarily going to be one of the females that we can use for our food stock. These fe females are anywhere from three days to three weeks away from final maturation. So we have to go another step and do a progesterone assay on these to to validate that these eggs are ready to be fertilized. Uh, we have a small trailer that uh, we put up on site we can use in the mobile lab. And each female is going to contribute 30 to 40 eggs for us. So 
going to be separated into two, two groups, control group and a test group. Control group is going to be incubate, incubated in uh, river water. Uh, test group is going to be incubated in uh, a progesterone solution at 16 degrees C uh, for, I believe, about 18 hours. And the next day, those eggs will essentially all be hard-boiled and laboriously sectioned by uh, Scott Schluter <laughs> um, and evaluated under a scope. And this is what a hard-boiled sturgeon egg looks like. So in order for a female to pass the progesterone assay, we're looking for what's called germinal vesicle breakdown. The germinal vesicle is that little dark blob right there. That's holding your genetic material, that's your nucleus. And we're looking for that to, to liberate that genetic material out into the egg itself. So for a female to pass this test, 100% of the treatment eggs have to break down, and at least 10% of the uh, control eggs have to break down. Uh, so if that was a treatment egg, that female would automatically fail and she would be let go. Um, so assuming we have some fish that have passed that test, we have our females and our males. We're mostly ready to go, except the fact that they're not on our schedule. So in order to get them onto our schedule, we have to do a hormone induction. Uh, there's two hormones that are typically used, the synthetic LHRHA and carpituitary hormone, which is simply freeze-dried carpituitary glands ground into a heart, uh, fine powder and reconstituted. So now that these fish have been <coughs> sitting in a tank for a couple days, they're pretty feisty, so it's a wrestle fest. Um, females will get two injections. The first one at midnight, I don't have a picture of that because it's dark. Um, so the first injection, is a priming dose, 90% of her total dose. The next injection, noon the next day, will be uh, the resolving dose, the, the final dose that she gets. All the males get 100% of the dose in one shot in the afternoon. So at that point, we're waiting till the next day when uh, we're going to start our egg take procedure. And first thing we do is we harvest sperm. So it's not unusual for a male to be able to we could fill up a 60cc syringe with sperm. Um, once we harvest sperm from all these males, they'll go back into the lab and be evaluated for motility. We're looking for at least 75% motility. Um, anything less than that, we would rather not use unless we absolutely have to. So assuming we have some males that pass that test and we make our selections uh, for which crosses we're going to do. Then we go and we, we start harvesting eggs. Now we found this to be, over many years of trial and error, um, about the simplest and least stressful for both um, individuals here and the fish. Basically just putting someone in the tank to lift the fish up and let body weight expel the eggs. Now each female will go through this, you know, typically three times. That fish needs to recharge, as Ron says. Um, so once eggs are out, they go over to be fertilized. Um, sperm has to be water activated. So once water activated, it's only viable for a minute and a half to two minutes. So this whole process is sort of uh, choreographed, if you will, to make sure that nobody gets ahead of anyone else in the whole process. At that point, you have fertilized eggs. And someone will sit there and stir them for 40 minutes in Fuller's Earth. Fuller's Earth is just a very fine clay. Uh, remember, these are swift water spawners. They will have adhesive eggs. And most of our culture facilities do not want sticky eggs coming in. So someone will sit there for 40 minutes and stir. And assuming things went right, which we've had plenty of hiccups through this whole process in two years, uh, you get a nice looking embryo there after a couple days. And by the um, end of September, early October, we'll, we'll have some handsome fish to, to stock out. Now from 1995 to the present, we've done about uh, 110,000 fish. We have stocked prior to that. Um, those fish were not what I would call the, the optimal quality fish. So um, just, just using you know, 1995 is when we started putting out uh, the bigger finger lengths. What we've learned from our years, 1992 to present down there, um, 
between DEC and ESF, we did a project down there for a few years, we've handled about 1,800 unique fish. Um, and since pit tag became available to us, we pit tag about 1,000 fish, a little bit over that. Um, most of the fish we collect are between 1,000 and 1,300 millimeters in length. Um, and if you notice that there's two, two spikes on that graphic, um, that's where we added 12 inch mesh nets, you know, bigger nets equal bigger fish in this case. Nothing really interesting here, obviously females, uh, as far as growth, will, will outpace the males. The take home from this slide is the variability in body form with these fish. For those of you who aren't really familiar with the handle of uh, you'll get the fat fish, the skinny fish, the fish that climb on rocks, and all that good Oscar Mayer stuff. Um, approximately five to five and a half percent of the fish that we handle are ripe females. Now obviously, the last few years we've done a little better than that. Um, prior, we've done a little worse. It really comes down to how many fish we have to handle because we're just there for brood stock. We're not doing systematic sampling. If we can catch our fish early, well, the number goes up. If we have to handle more fish, the number goes down. Interesting things that we've seen, most interesting, all of these yellow dots, yellow stars, are fish that have had some sort of um, um, interaction with a hydroelectric facility to get down to where we're catching them in the South Channel. Uh, for a couple of these fish, it's simply probably going over spillway, out migrating. For these other fish, everything up here going through the uh, international section of the St. Lawrence, they had to either be entrained through the Moses Saunders Tower Project or find their way down through the shipping canal. So it, it's, it's more of just a, a, an interesting little thing. Uh, how they get there, we don't know. Spawning beds. DEC has had, had an interaction with, with the creation of four different spawning beds on the St. Lawrence River. Two of which are in the international section, two um, below the, the power project. I don't really have time to talk about them. Andy Preston, who actually monitors these beds, has got a poster out there with some interesting data. Um, two of those beds um, have been home runs, as you can see, fish, fish on rock worked out well. Uh, the other ones have been strikeouts. So uh, it's been said several times today, the amount of effort it goes to putting um, you know, what equates to a simple pile of rocks in a system like this where you've got 280,000 cubic feet per second, you know, one plus meter per second of velocity. Uh, it takes a lot of planning and effort to get there. So I guess the takeaway from this is sometimes like, if you build it, they still might not come. <laughs> So I'm going to finish off here with uh, our little tagging project we've done in the Eastern Basin of Ontario, specifically Black River Bay. Um, in 1995, we, we caught a couple of scurgeon when we were electrofishing for walleye. Um, and it took me 10 whole years to get back to see what's going on in the Black River with scurgeon. And so it happened to be a very low water year. Black River um, watershed is big and usually in the springtime it's running to where you would not want to set foot in it. Uh, 2005, low water year, there was really nothing coming over spillways. It was very easy. So we got gill nets in, we got egg traps in, and that there is the only ripe running female I handled in my career. So obviously these fish are there to spawn. They're, they're doing something. What are we going to do with it? We're just going to try to evaluate and see how many fish are, are using this area? Um, most of the time, you can't get into the Black River and work there. So we sort of we, we worked our way out to catch oh, okay, that's not sturgeon. sturgeon out in Black River Bay. Um, and as you can see, Lake Ontario in the spring is a happy place. There's no waves. Everybody smiles. <laughs> <laughs> um, however, we can still get out there and on a, on a more regular basis collect fish. Um, and we usually do have, have at least one day of catfishing in, in our collection series. So what's happened out there from 2009 to 2016, we put 152 individual pit tags in this very small population that's, that's utilizing Black River Bay and the Black River as a spawning, spawning area. Um, 
interesting bits, these are all small bits that I have here, is site fidelity is very high. This is a small population. It's so high that number 788 there we're very familiar with because we've collected him five different times. It's like he, he won't go away. He likes to, he likes to, to come into the boat and see us. Um, but we, we've had various fish have been captured, you know, different numbers of time. 24 fish have been recaptured twice. And uh, last year our recapture rate was 40%. It's been very sporadic. I mean, it, it bounces all over the place, but 40% is pretty high. <laughs> so another little tidbit of interest here is the Red Star in Black River Bay. Uh, one of my fish from early tagging, uh, USGS, Dawn's crew, caught that up in Ogdensburg a number of years ago. This is where Randy Jackson's fish go. When I lake, they don't like it, so they end up down in Black River Bay. One of Dawn's fish from Cayuga Inlet, or Outlet, or, uh, Black River Bay, and one of her Genesee fish. It's becoming sort of a little melting pot. So you know, we're, we're always pretty excited when, when the pit tag breeder beeps, and it's a number that's definitely not one of ours, or we see one of these Carlin tags. Um, for what it's worth, I've now got 10 fish, at least 10 fish, that have shown some sort of down, out migration of the system. Uh, hopefully, you know, in the, in the years to come, there'll be more fish added to that and, and some pattern will develop. Uh, that somebody really thinks is important. Uh, I'm still waiting for one of Dimitri's fish. <laughs> <laughs> they don't seem to want to come. Maybe this year's yeah, the year. Good uh, a few final thoughts. Uh, sometimes you need a bigger boat. <laughs> Moby Dick is alive and well, but not nearly as impressive as you can believe. And finally, if you swim slow enough, you will grow zebra mussels. <laughs> And thank you to all our partners because we wouldn't do half of what we do without all those folks contributing. Yeah. Anybody have a question? Yeah, what, what were the size of the fish that I didn't catch it that, were in, that you said were in a frame that went through? Well, we don't know. All of, we, they, those were at least adult, those were all adult fish. Oh, really? Yeah, but they could have gone through as young fish or? Well, I, I spoke to uh, one of the biologists who's retired, uh, Kevin McGrath. Anyway, he, he's done a lot of studies on what can and can't go through those turbines. And, yeah. and he really paused quite a bit. He never gave me a real answer as to whether, you know, one of those adult fish would fit down through there. We did an entrainment study with Norman Gould uh, in fall of 2015 with fingerling and yearling size turbines. We actually ran them through the turbine at Jam, and uh, we had uh, just shy of 100% survival on both sides. This going through, we only had one that showed a blade strike, and uh, everything else was perfectly alive and well. We held them for 48 hours, and we're just going to manage to spread it right now. They, they seem to that size, the smaller size fish really did well going through the turbine. These fish are amazing and resilient. It's, uh, the head on the dam is, uh, I think it was 12 feet, but it was, a, it was a, I don't know why turbines, but it was like most unfish friendly turbine out uh, uh, left or something like that. It's the worst one you could have. Okay, uh, we got to move right along here.